Valerie Young, a free software activist from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she's going to be talking about reproducible builds. So please put your hands together. Okay, great. Hello. Um, I'm talking about reproducible builds. Um, you might, the, this is Dolly and her clone here. It's, seems somehow relevant. Um, so my name is Valerie Young. Um, I'm Spectronaut Online, and I've been a Ubuntu or Debian user since 2012, and I'm also a programmer. Um, but I've only contributed to Debian since March 2016, thanks to Outreachy, which you should all know a lot about by now. Um, and uh, but, but more plugging of Outreachy. Um, so Outreaching is funding for women and minorities to work on free software projects. It's a three-month-long project, kind of like Google Summer of Code, except that you don't have to be a student. And almost everyone that I know has actually been an adult woman who wanted more of a career change or wanted some ve ve venue of entry into contributing to free software. Um, and it's also not limited to programming, which is super cool. So you can, uh, you can hire people to do user research or design. And um, the thing that, about it that I think is the most important is that it really provides you like a free software cultural mentor, which is, I think, of course, the, the, actually the hardest part of for starting con contributing to free software. If you don't grow up with it or you're not used to the culture, it's very foreign and very bizarre. Um, even though I was like enthusiastic about free software for so long, it was very long before I contributed because like, I don't know, I'd never used IRC before. I don't know how to talk in a chat room. Um, so anyway, but this, this talk is about reproducible builds. Um, and uh, I'll first define it for you because sometimes it's a little bit confusing. Uh, then we'll talk about the state of software freedoms without reproducible builds and uh, give a progress report of the various work done into getting reproducible builds and all of the work that you will be able to reuse in your own projects. And then the future of FOSS, once we have achieved reproducible builds, it will be an exciting time. Okay, so first, uh, what is reproducible builds? Uh, the, the reason that it's a little bit hard to, to define or why people don't really um, get the right idea when they perhaps hear just these two words together is because reproducible builds encaps encapsulates a lot of uh, intermediate technical steps and a lot of various projects um, and kind of shifts in programming development. Uh, that we want to, to achieve in order to do one specific thing, which is to be able to link the binary back to the source code that it came from. So uh, link with absolute certainty. We know where this binary came from. Uh, we can look at the source code and, uh, and read it, etc. cetera. So uh, to, to do this, we need to achieve largely two goals, um, which I'll talk about throughout this presentation. The first one is reproducible binaries. Um, the compilation of binaries Binary programs should always be reproducible and deterministic. Every time you compile a program, you should always get the exact same bits in the end when you recompile it on your computer. As it is right now, that's not the case. Each time you compile a program, you'll probably get different bits. Um, the second part is that the, the, the build environment should be reproducible. Um, so the build environment of any specific program that you have on your computer should be discoverable and reproducible by anyone. Um, so if you have a binary, you should know how to re perfectly reconstruct that binary. Um, great. So at the last Reproducible Build Summit in December, we actually made a definition for Reproducible Builds. It's uh, technical and quite detailed, um, three, three or four years after the project started. Uh, so here it just says, a build is reproducible if given the same source code, build environment, and build instructions. Any party can recreate a bit-by-bit -bit identical copy of all specified artifacts. And the bold words um, and, uh, are uh, outlined in more detail in the rest of this definition, which you can find. So, the state of software freedoms. Uh, you guys have probably certainly all seen these before, the four software freedoms. Uh, the freedom to run, the freedom to study and change, the freedom to redistribute, and the freedom to release your improvements. I'm only going to be talking about the first freedom, uh, the freedom to study, and the freedom to change your software. Um, so let's talk about each one individually. Can we study the programs? Are we, uh, can you study your free software program? Um, well, what is the free software program? It's two things. It's the source code and the binary. Uh, in general, you only, the, the human readable source code, I should say, and the machine readable binary, um, you only usually have, any user only ever has, the, 
the machine-readable binary, um, but to be able to study it, you need the human-readable source. And uh, <laughs> this, this is a one-way function that we have, as, as I've alluded to and you all know, um, to go from source to binary. So how do you prove that, that, uh, that you do have the source code for the binary that, that you've downloaded? Um, can, can you actually be studying the source of the binary that you're using? And the question is not without faith, or reproducible builds are the answer. Um, because if we recompile that source, we aren't gonna get the same binary. So can you be sure that the binary you're originally using came from it? Don't know. Um, so just to, to, to present some straw man arguments, you might be like, ah, oh, well, uh, like, you just said that you can't prove the binary came from the source code, but you know, if you really inspect the bits, probably with some fancy computer forensics, there's some experts who could definitely identify that the binary came from that source code. Um, but without it being bit for bit identical, like they compared to the, the two binaries and maybe they recognize there's a timestamp and so the timestamp is the only difference between the binaries. But just as, as a motivation for why we really, really need this bit by bit identical um, uh, outcome of programming or of compiling programs, um, there's a really great talk that talks about this. Uh, Seth, Seth Schoen and Mike Perry give a talk called Reproducible Builds like four years ago at 30, 31, three years ago at 31C3. And one thing they mention is the OpenSSIH bug and exploit that maybe some of you have heard about because it was kind of popular and at the time. Uh, a developer wrote a lessons or equal to sign instead of a less than sign and this produced a bug in the OpenSSH program that made um, computers using it remotely exploitable. And the difference between that less than and equal sign and less than sign was exactly one bit. So it's one bit difference that can make a program expo exploitable or, or a program safe. Um, so again, we need this bit by bit identicalness to really prove that, that we have the binary that we think we have. Um, next is, uh, why can't I just trust the developer who compiled and signed the program and delivered it to me? Um, well, again, we know this from white papers and from, from actual exploits that developer tools can be compromised and add uh, secret malicious code to programs. Xcode Ghost is a famous example and here's some more information about it if you want to look it up. Um, it is a compromised version of X, the, the tools Xcode, yeah? <laughs> for writing Microsoft, I mean, Windows, Mac app applications. I get those uh, other operating systems confused. Okay, so <laughs> uh, let's talk about Freedom 2, I mean Freedom 1B. Uh, can we change the program um, as it is right now? Well, back to this, um, this uh, dual nature of free software, the source and the binary. In general, you download the binary uh, and then maybe you want to modify it, so you download the source. But how do you build it? Will it build? Uh, what are the build instructions? Uh, would, what, which library do you need that it will actually successfully run? Um, so uh, can you change the program? Uh, I mean, we all know this already too. We, we talk about the difficulty of entry for modifications for uh, uh, people not already entrenched in the, the community or the project. So um, you can't really uh, necessarily recreate this binary, but, but you could very easily, once we do achieve this goal of reproducible builds, if you have this reproducible build environment, then hopefully anytime you want to modify a binary, you can get the source code and reconstruct it. Cool. So in summary, reproducible builds delivers the freedom to change and modify, to, change, to study and change your programs. Um, or if I can be even more bold, it's not free and open source software if it can't be reproducibly built. Um, doesn't really satisfy the freedoms if this is not the case. So now that uh, I've convinced you all that we should be doing this, I'll, I'll give you some actually really hopeful and exciting <coughs> advice about uh, what we've done already in the community to achieve these things. Um, so first step is reproducible binaries. Um, can we do it? So uh, first briefly to the two success stories um, in uh, achieving reproducible binaries. The first one uh, famously is Bitcoin. They've been reproducibly built since 2012. Um, their motivation is that they have, there's a lot of money in Bitcoin and uh, they want people to use Bitcoin but they need to guarantee that their software is secure and so that people don't think they're just gonna lose their bits and lose their, their Bitcoin dollars. 
So um, being able to deliver a provably secure uh, um, Bitcoin core system is really important to them. Um, to do this, they created Gideon, which is essentially a wrapper around um, VirtualBox and Git, and it has these standardized inputs. It does what you expect. It like starts the virtual machine, downloads the appropriate things, builds and outputs the binary. Um, so this, this, and I'll, I guess El Gideon was also written in C++, I think. Um, so just one language. They're able to make the language pretty deterministic. Um, and they lock down these build environment variables, which sometimes result in different outputs in the binary. So things like the compiler and the kernel version or uh, other build machine metadata, the host name and the time, etc. This was all solved by Gideon. So they could produce exactly the same identical binaries. Um, the next project to do this was Tor. Um, they've been reproducibly built since 2013. That's the wrong date. Um, why uh, did they do this? Of course, there's like human lives at stakes, essentially. These people using Tor, um, sometimes there are governments that would prefer to know what they're doing and uh, prefer Tor be remotely exploitable. So uh, they are much more complex than the, the Bitcoin Core software. It's a Firefox browser and uh, 50 packages on top of that. Um, so they used Gideon, but that, that it was, they, just using Gideon was not a solution in itself. They also had to solve a lot of other sources of indeterminacy on the way. And to uh, give you uh, kind of some fun examples of what those are, so you have a, a picture of, of the problems we need to solve, um, are uh, Python OS walk they found uh, some indeterminacies in. The multi-threaded build process results in random ordering of files. So then if you're going through the files, you end up getting a, a, a different ordering each time, ending up with slightly different binaries in the end. So if you uh, sort those first, then you have deterministic output. Another fun example is that in GNU bin utils had a uh, bug that produced it in cons three consistently random bits in their output, um, <laughs> only on their Windows build. Uh, and these were from uh, uh, uninitialized memory, and they were eventually able to get a patch of that. Um, but problems that they couldn't solve, just, just to give you, a, it's been many years since they've done this, it takes a really long time for them to build this way with the Gideon uh, operating system, so it's kind of clunky and difficult. Um, and they're actually presently moving to Docker to do their reproducible builds. They're halfway there. And also, if you want more really fun facts about their efforts to become reproducible, there's a, there's a blog post. So, you think reproducing Tor sounded maybe a little bit tricky? Try Debian. <laughs> um, Debian has uh, over 50,000 binary packages, 1,000 developers, some crazy number of upstream developers, um, all the languages, all the compilers. So we want, uh, you know, every package in Debian to be reproducible. How on earth do we do that? Um, first, I want to say that I, I'm. This is like a Debian star uh, progress report. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about in the next section was largely spearheaded by the Debian project, but the, a lot of other projects have gotten on board and contributed as well. So a lot of these tools you might see hosted in Debian, but like, the, I'll, I'll have a slide at the end thanking the other projects that have been involved too. And also, again, although we, we have been doing this work, most of this work will be useful to you as well. So, um, yeah. Be excited. Anyway, but a, a brief history. Um, how on earth did we start this huge task of trying to become a reproducible operating system and software distribution? Um, well, at first it started at a, a, just a discussion at DevConf 13 um, by Lunar uh, and a wiki page. And uh, the, at, this, at this discussion, they just decided to try to make a few packages reproducible and hopefully like this will catch on and people will think that it's pretty cool. Um, and they, they quickly realized that a lot of the sources of indeterminacy existed in the packaging. So they were able to fix the packaging and then suddenly a lot of packages within Debian were reproducible. So that was a very like kind of hopeful first step. And in the end of 2014, a year and a half later, we started continuously testing every single Debian package for reproducibility. And to give you an uh, idea of how far we came, the first uh, rebuild was in 2013, and only 24 packages, 24% of the packages that we, we tested were reproducible, just building it twice, essentially, with mostly the same um, build environment. 
information. Um, and then January 2017, we are now at 93% reproducible on AMD 64 and testing. Yep. So, that's pretty exciting. It's pretty cool. Um, so first, I will tell you a bit about the, re the, the continuous testing setup we have um, and the way that it's helped us. So uh, all of the information of the continuous testing that we do is on tests.reproducibilebuilds.org. Um, slash Debian, actually, if you want the Debian information, although this redirects that. But, um, so this is a graph of uh, re the, how many packages are reproducible over time on AMD64 in testing, I think. Um, and so the green is reproducible, the orange is not reproducible, and the red is fails to build from source. Um, yep. Anyway, so then if you have a package that you work on or you're curious about, you can go to test.reproducibilebuilds.org slash package, and uh, we'll show you if it's reproducible or unreproducible based on our tests. So what is a test? A test is simply building something twice and uh, then comparing it. <laughs> uh, and uh, what, but between the two builds, we introduce a lot of variations to the build environment that we think should not affect the binary in the end. Um, so this includes time, time zone, language, user, program ID, shell, kernel, CPU, um, file ordering, things like this. Uh, not all of these variations uh, exist for all of the different architectures we test on. Um, we test on AMD64, ARM64, ARMHF, and i386 and uh, packages that are in testing and stable and experimental. So uh, when you upload a new package, you can test, f figure out pretty soon whether or not it's reproducible in our architecture. Um, so also on this uh, page for this package, you can see a lot of other really useful information, including something, uh, the results of this program that we have written called Diffoscope. Um, so, Diffoscope takes two binaries and compares them and gives you a really nice readable diff as an output. Um, and Diffoscope is certainly for everyone. It's a tool that, that can be very useful for you, not even for reproducible builds, but for like your own QA work and figuring out bugs that exist. So it recursively unpacks and compares binaries. It knows about a lot of different archives um, and uh, formats. Um, and it's also very easily extendable and easily downloadable. So you guys should get this. It's also easily tryable. If you want to just go to try.diffscope.org, you can uh, compare two binaries there too. Um, so again, this is a, a tool for uh, debugging and figuring out what's not reproducible. If you want to find out if your, your package is reproducible, you should just build it twice and take a hash or just compare the bits. You don't need this to tell you whether it's reproducible. Um, so, great. So another thing that we have on this site is we do a lot of issue tracking. So we have notes for most unreproducible packages. Uh, they're tracked in a, in a Git uh, repo. And on these notes, the, they're notes that were produced by someone looking at this Diffoscope result and being like, ah, this is the source of like indeterminacy or this is the bug that produced this. Um, so that we can like tr track the, the various like uh, things in our programming world that are um, producing non-deterministic output. Um, and a lot of the things we do know how to fix and some things that we don't yet know the right solution for. Um, the things that we know how to fix, we submit bugs for with patches. And so many incredible Debian developers and contributors have kept up these notes and also have submitted over 2,000 bugs with patches to various Debian maintainers um, to make their programs reproducible. And uh, we've also filed over 3,000 bugs with this failed to build from source issue, which is itself a really interesting and useful QA work. Um, so that, that's within Debian, of course. These are on Debian projects, uh, packages, but you can imagine not all of these, of course, have to do with the Debian-specific packaging. A lot of these bugs actually have to do with the upstream. And only recently have we uh, started doing cross-distro issue, issue tracking. Um, Right, so of course, if we like send this pack, patch upstream and the upstream doesn't accept it or we haven't written a patch really quite good enough for them, um, we don't want other distros to have to reinvent the patch. Um, so we have now, thanks to OpenSUSE, since the last Reproducible Builds Summit, a, a, just a, a Git repo that tracks these upstream patches. So various distributions can reuse the work. 
Um, now I'll talk about a few common issues. Um, the most common source of non-determinacy, in fact, is timestamps. Uh, so 112 issues uh, in our, uh, which is like half of them, I think, uh, um, that we track are related to the recording of the time of the build in the binary. So you think you need your, your build timestamp for uh, documentation or reconstructing the build environment maybe? Or maybe a seed for randomness? Some profit, I don't know. Uh, you don't actually, we, we, <laughs> we have discovered. We haven't yet run into a situation where you actually need the build timestamp in your code. Instead, you can use something that we encourage which is source date epoch. This is the time of the last modification of this, the source code. Um, which I, we think is a much more useful um, date and, and all of these other issues in terms of documentation, in terms of like getting an idea of when this software was built or should be built, um, a seed for randomness, etc. So uh, the source state epoch is, a, is an environment variable. Um, we have a specification written uh, for upstream and developers and, uh, and it's been used actually already in a lot of various projects um, to great success. Great reproducibility. So, uh, another common issue that I want to bring up is build paths. Build paths has been a, a, a very tricky um, thing to solve. So, if you build it twice in different different um, build paths, you'll get different bits because the build path is recorded in your binary. Um, we have 2,000 packages that are unreproducible if you uh, uh, if you vary the build path, and we don't yet actually have a solution for them. Ex well, we do now. It's in the works. Um, and also, just, just as a side note, a lot of times the build path is recorded as a, for de debugging information. And our solution is also another command line variable, source prefix map, um, which will record, uh, essentially replace the build path with um, like the uh, path that you're building from, uh, or the, the, the root of the source code. Um, and it's a little bit more complicated than that because some people want multiple build paths in their, their binaries, but that, that, that's soon to come. Um, so a few more fun facts about our uh, test setup. Um, I just want to call out that all of our um, hardwares, uh, our virtual machines are donated by ProfitBricks.com and uh, the testing is, set, is managed with uh, Jenkins. We also test several other projects on the same um, infrastructure, which is pretty cool. Um, these are these projects are in a various states because they don't have people working, or some of them are now starting to have people working on it more full time. But there's a lot of Debian developers who are working on this full time. So Debian's quite built out. But test.reproducibuilds.org/slash this one of these projects, and you'll see which, what testing we're doing for them. And if you're interested too, you should. Um, interface with Holger on OFTC or, or talk to me, Lambi, and you should write some scripts and your project can also be tested for reproducibility. So, um, a summary of important points from this section. Binary reproducibility is not impossible and you, too, can write reproducible code. Um, <laughs> First step is accept our patches. Uh, second step is probably use source state epoch. Um, you can uh, try Diffiscope and uh, on reproducible-builds.org, we have a lot of useful advice for how to write reproducible code from what we've learned. And also you can see Chris Lamb's talk tomorrow at 10.40 in this very room um, to, to learn some more exciting things. Great, so next, uh, reproducible build environments. Um, reproducible binaries are not enough. Uh, we, as we say, Debian is 0% reproducible until any user can reproduce any given binary Debian package. Um, back to this, yeah, build environment should be reproducible uh, in the first slide. Um, so how do we solve this? Uh, a common solution is just to do some sandboxing of your uh, development process and then you can kind of hand that sandbox off to other people. Um, so the Gideon virtual machine with these concept of descriptors is an example of this. Docker containers can also be used for re reproducibility in this way. And uh, or those things like the OpenWRT open SDK contains all of its 
dependencies with it, so you don't have to worry about which dependencies to use or download them yourself. So there's there are some kind of potential problems with this. Um, one is that can you trust the bundled OS? I mean, I guess we still have that too, even if you're trying to build on your computer, can you trust your computer? But if everyone's building on the same OSs, then that's a bit more of a problem because you only have to, or the same virtual machines, then you only have to compromise one virtual machine and everyone is, that everyone is using. Uh, and then is the process too big or too slow? Are you shipping too much code, et cetera? Um, so we have another solution, uh, the build info files. Um, this is a standard in Debian. It's a uh, file that links uh, the source code in the binary and, record, and the recorded build environment of when that binary was created. And we create it and we sign it when we're, we're constructing the, deb, the dot .debs. Um, so this is a kind of a recording of, of the build environment of the binary while you're re producing the binary. Um, and the build environment contains, of, of course, like a pointer to the source and not yet, but we hope a checksum of the source itself too. Um, and also a checksum of generated binaries and exact versions of all the build dependencies, et cetera. Looks something like this. Um, ongoing work. Uh, oh yeah, ongoing work in this area is that we, we, so we currently construct these build info files, but we don't necessarily have an easy way to download them um, based on the binary that you have downloaded. And also, in, it, cool since the Reproducible Build Summit, yet again, uh, RPM is starting to implement, or people are starting to try to implement this in RPM packages as well. And uh, f future work. Um, so once we have these build info files, it would really be great if we had automated tools to reconstruct the build environment in order to reconstruct that exact binary, because of course you might have different versions of uh, the libraries recorded on your computer than is in the build info file. Um, so with Debian, it's cool because we have archive.debian.net, so if you want any specific version of any software, you can get it pretty easily, so these tools hopefully will come into existence when we get there. Other distros, I don't know how to solve this problem. If they have this or what. Um, so, summary of important points here. Um, build env environment reproduci reproducibility is not impossible, um, and the solutions are varied and project specific. I think it's best if you integrate it with your build practices and tools, um, and containers or build info files might be useful to you. Um, and uh, remember, delivering the build environment metadata with binary software delivers the freedom to change the software. So uh, if you really want to be giving this freedom to your users, to your potential contributors, then, then you should try to, to add this to your um, building processes. So the last last piece of this progress report um, is verifying reproducibility. So reproducible builds are not enough yet again until we can surface the verified reproducibility to a non-developer. Or um, It's great if you can prove it yourself, but we want the whole world to be able to trust the free software that they use is reproducible. So um, in and de this is this is some things that we're thinking about in Debian about this this future state. Um, one is once we do have these reproducible binaries, um, who will re rebuild them and verify our software? Um, hopefully, other dedicated uh, rebuilders, um, maybe dedicated rebuilders that aren't Debian. Maybe like some other distribution rebuilds us, and uh, we just re uh, rebuild the other distribution. Um, and then there's this, like, no, well, maybe like other developers can rebuild the binary and sign it and re upload that somewhere to show that there's trust in the binary. But uh, maybe, maybe that won't really scale because we have too many packages in Debian, so we can't really expect everyone to be uploading uh, enough signatures for these rebuilt binaries. Um, we shall see. Um, Eftroid is already thinking about this as well and uh, has implemented a way to do this in their build servers, which I'll explain briefly. This is a nice slide I took from someone else, did not make this. <laughs> um, uh, so here, uh, there's a, the, the Eftroid server um, will take both a compiled 
uh, source code from the developer and also a pointer to the git repo where their source code is and rebuild it. And if the two binaries match, um, then they'll deliver that package to um, users uh, or they'll show it on their app store. And so this has been built into the, the F-Droid um, builders, except that it's not implemented because uh, the build environment problems haven't been solved. And so if you built the binary on your computer, you're probably gonna end up with different bits than the one that the build server has. So it's kind of in a latent state. Um, hopefully we'll get there soon. So yeah, binary reproducible uh, Android applications is not quite achieved. And then next, um, yeah, yeah, downloading and verifying uh, reproducible packages. Uh, ho hopefully, maybe when you apt install your package, you'll be able to have this question. Do we really wanna install this unreproducible software? Or um, do you want to build these packages with unconfirmed checksums before installing? Or how many signed checksums do you require to call a package reproducible? How many builders do you want or which build, rebuilders in, in the world of rebuilders do you trust <laughs> if there is some disagreement? Um, cool, really cool is that Geek's user verification is also something that, or Geek, user verification is something that, that Geeks is thinking about as well. They already have something called Geeks Challenge where uh, instead of just downloading the binary, you also uh, download the source code and recompile it and compare it. Um, and there's a blog post about how they think they might handle re rebuilders in this process too and comparing to multiple rebuilders. Or you only download it if multiple rebuilders agree on the binary. Um, so that's cool. You can read more about that. <laughs> and again, summary of important points from the section. Um, user verification is not impossible. Uh, we will need a probably eventually dedicated rebuilders to verify trust. And, uh, and also it's mostly unsolvable. Cross this bridge when we get to it, once we solve the other problems, maybe. Um, but as a motivation, delivering the ver verification of reproducibility with binaries delivers the trust we have in free software because we can study the source. So, the last section. The future of FOSS with reproducible builds. Uh, so, Imagine a world where we do have reproducible build environments and we do get the freedom to change our programs. Um, one, one thing that I think is very important to note is that this makes GPL compliance trivial, as was said in um, Bikun's talk earlier. Um, if you, the tools to compile binaries are also always producing the metadata to recreate them, then you ship your binary and they're like, hey, I have this binary, I want the corresponding source code so I can hack on this, this uh, this system with the embedded Linux distribution in it. Um, they'll be like, ah, yeah, that binary, okay, check some, ah, this, this build info file, this like source code, here you are, great, hack away. Um, so that's cool. And uh, again, this like, I, I think that this like guaranteed contribute compilation um, will lower the bar barrier to um, co contributors and maybe lower the barrier to, to contributors who are like could probably edit code, like could probably like, change the color of a button, but don't want to deal with compiling software or the rest of the process. So you might get more con contributions from um, like designers or user researchers, et cetera, and they don't have to rely on a programmer implementing their things. Um, so great. Oh, and oh, I guess the last thing, well, you already saw it. Um, Maybe, maybe also if you have this kind of ease of compilation or this kind of this ease of development cycle, uh, even organizations might prefer free software more. They don't need to hire some expert in the software in order to modify it. They're like, ah, we can, we can use this free software and probably this random programmer we found off the street will be able to modify it for us to do specifically what we want. Cool. So. Uh, re, uh, great, so the future with reproducible binaries. Um, well, we get the freedom to study our programs. Um, and what I think is really important to call out here is that this could encourage regulation of binary software in general. Um, we suddenly like know for sure that we can audit these binaries that we are using, these sometimes incredibly important binaries, like the ones that are in voting machines. Um, or uh, you probably have all heard, or maybe some of you have heard of the VW emission scandal. Um, the VW cars had program, 
software in them that, that lied on purpose. It had code that, that told they were emitting less um, pollution than they actually were. Uh, and this was found out through reverse engineering. But if we actually had some regulation around software that does really important things like this, or then, then we would expect that the binary would be occasionally audited and people would, uh, governments would read the code, maybe even if it was proprietary. If we like make this the norm in free software, like you can always audit your binaries, then maybe like proprietary will have to, to follow. Um, and governments will eventually pick this up. So state preference for free software, because we should audit our code. Um, and great, so we achieve reproducible builds as a whole, our, our whole goal. Um, we, we also have uh, assurance against compromised binaries. We have insurance against compromised developers, and we have assurance against compromised tools, unless you compromise all of the tools. Um, but, you know, that's harder, so. Uh, great, so then in this case, free software becomes provably more, um, provably and transparently safer than proprietary software. Um, because people are actually rebuilding it. No one can rebuild the proprietary software as it is. So, wow, I'm so on time. This is the, thank you all of the projects that have now contributed or tried to become reproducible in one way or another. There's quite a lot of them, perhaps ones that you work on. Perhaps you didn't know about reproducible builds, but you see your project up here, so um, you can hunt down the people that work on it. We actually keep track, I'll show you in a second. Um, and also thanks to these people who have given money <laughs> to us to work on it. Uh, and how to get involved. So if you want to write reproducible code, check out reproduciblebuilds.org. Uh, the projects that I had listed on the, the last slide, we have contacts for a lot of them. If you go to reproduciblebuilds.org slash who, uh, and you should also talk to us. Um, we have a general mailing list. And we have an IRC channel, and we have weekly IRC meetings, and uh, also a blog post, which I didn't, a re weekly blog post about updates um, in the project. Okay, cool, and yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. But, but back to the slide, the important one. does exist within Debian, and I mean code, code like Java exists within Debian, so um, I, I guess there, there is work on it. I can't, I can't think of any particular specific initiatives, but if you want to talk about the specific language, Chris Lamb is a really good person to talk about with. I, I worked mostly on the test infrastructure, but he's been in the like trenches um, for a long time. Hi, um, just wondering, has anyone looked at GCC? GCC? Oh, yeah, dude, GCC is all about reproducible builds. They accept our patches. What about it? Do you have questions? I'm sorry, Yeah, GCC. Oh, is the compiler reproducible? Ah, uh, yeah, so this is, this is part of the like bootstrapping problem, which other people have thought about. Um, I have not, but I think that there's a bootstrappable.com that um, essentially talks about if it's still, if it's up, it was, it was written at the Reproducible Summit that talks about the problems that we have with reproducibility when we're um, building things with itself, like GCC with GCC. We want all of the dependencies themselves also to be reproducible. Um, so this is, uh, a, a lot of what I talk about is, does apply to the whole tool chain. Oh, file objects. 
I, I think I was still a little confused by the question. You're nodding, Chris. Do you have something to say? <laughs> Hi, yeah, as I understood the question, um, yes, if you, um, intermediate artifacts are really useful. They can get like, a better cash to ratio. Um, it's easy to do some folks in Google, and they will save them to you from the money you save from these caches. It's like quite it's not really. So, is that just a question you from? Yeah. And also, the, um, the CO2 that you're saving. multiple build info files for programs, right, if the, if the versions change the binary. Um, and I don't think that we currently list multiple versions because that reproduce the same binary. It's just you'd have to create a new build info file. Um, and also, this is the build info file for the .deb. So in it is a sig si signature of the .deb file. If you have a new distribution and you're not using that packaging, then you're going to have a different binary. Um, so it's not useful to you. I guess it was a question about how do you bootstrap the trust for a whole view. Yeah, yeah, they would have to they would have to produce their own build up profiles and someone would have to verify them. Yeah. Yep. We have time for one more. Hi, just wondering if you consider Gen two or any of the other source based distributions. Oh uh, um well Geeks is actually sort of a source based uh, distribution. You can you can also download the binary if someone else has recompiled it and you trust them. I think, but um, but you still like I don't know. You're still building that from source code on your computer. You might want to make sure the binary that you produce is the same as the binary someone else has produced. So hopefully you can track that information. Thanks so much, Val, for sharing all this amazing information.